Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle. Check, check, check. It's a new guy. It's your boy, ECEO, and I'm with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? No, 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 I want y'all to stop what you're doing right now. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. I mean, on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, you name it, we're on it. But if you want to see our visuals, you got to hop over to our YouTube channel. That's where you can see all our visuals. Just type in Boss Talk Podcast 101 anywhere and you will see us pop up. But don't only subscribe on our YouTube channel. We'd love to have your membership. That Y'all always see us and say, how can we support you? That's how you can support us. How you get to our membership on the each and every video, including this one. In our description section, there's a link. Click the link, follow the instructions, and thank you in advance. Man, check him. Hey, take him back. Hey, <laughs> hey, man, listen, man, we we got a guy in here today, y'all. He don't need no introduction. Yeah, this, dude. No, he don't really need introduction. He been here before. It's been a minute though, but he been here before, man. Sean Jock Taylor's in the building, man. What's going on? What up, dog? Man, I see the book, man. I, I got the book right here, man. Coach Prime Dion Sanders, the making of men. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears in that. Man, you know what, man? Listen, this is my copy. I got the signature. I'm very happy about it. I'm 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 getting See, it. That's in. a real sign right there. Yeah, yeah. And and he, and, and he run because he family gotta be. So man, hey man, how you been? Great. I look great. So I well, you look great. great. You look great. I, I I ain't taking nothing from you. I just, just had I, my birthday, so I'm feeling well, good. Really? Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Did, what did you do for your birthday? Did I tell you I had to kick? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I went to the Mavericks game, man. Went to the Mavericks game, had some dinner, chilled out. Yeah. I mean, I'm old now, so. Man, you acting like me, don't I'm say I'm closer it. to 60 than 50, even though I don't look like it. So, Whoa, man. So, you know, I be chilling out on the birthday these days. Yeah, you don't even tell too many people? No. I don't, I don't <laughs> accept Cash App and Zelle and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> man, so, man, you know. And, and my dad sent me a birthday gift, so I ain't too, young, I ain't that, too old that's, for that. See, and, and that's, that's a, a blessing. He what? sent me a good gift. What did he send you? Gift card. Ooh, <laughs> you can't to go where? wrong. To Three, where? 300. Ooh, where Amazon. Are you go? Oh, Amazon. So Amazon. Amazon. That's all you need. Now, that's a backstory to it. I mean, he sent the wrong gift card. It first took me like two hours and some YouTube videos. I was like, Dad, <laughs> what you doing, man? And he said, Oh, I think I sent the wrong card. Wow. So he got it all fixed out. So the new one's here. It's all good, though. Man, it's just good to have you back on the show, man. I know you've been busy, man. I, I'm getting into the book, but I want to just go back a little bit. And maybe that's going to be in the book as well. But, like, when you left here, you was doing a, a, a pod. Was you doing a, a show with another guy? You I was, was doing, doing a, a I was doing a radio show on ESPN Radio. ESPN Radio. With uh, Matt McClain. With Matt McClain. Yeah, what? Who is now on the ticket, 1310. Uh, doing a show with Donovan Lewis, one of my boys. Those are both my boys. Okay. Uh, so what happened with that? Uh, life. Meaning, I mean, it's just the nature of the beast, man. We were uh, doing a show. We had done it for two years. We took it from number 31, which, if y'all didn't know, that's dead last in DFW. <laughs> wow. To number 11. And uh, we were pretty much getting ready to go get promoted to move to drive time, which means three to seven, which also means a much bigger check. Uh, we were talking about that in July. And in August, they said, hey, ESPN getting out the radio business. Wow. And so the show disappeared just like everybody else and everything else who uh, was working at ESPN in Dallas. Wow. What did, how did that affect you? What did you do? What was your first thought? You're like, okay, what? Because this was just the first time you ever seen something just end? No. I mean, I've been, that was, that was the second time, I think it was, the, it was the second or third time I got laid off. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Channel 5, was it 5? Yep, yeah, got, got laid off from there. And so I can't remember the order because it happened so frequently. Yeah. I just know ESPN was first. I really can't remember whether it is, whether I think, I think the radio show was the last one. And uh, by then I had already, you no, know, definitely the radio show was the last one. And by then I had already been trans, uh, transitioning to uh, what I was going to do in case, because I was right in the middle of COVID. Yeah. So yeah. it was okay. If we get hit by COVID, what am I going to do? I'm tired of being laid off. And so uh, I always say this, man. I was um, at the gym. At the gym was closed. I was at the apartment complex, my boy's apartment complex, working out, trying to figure out what I was going to do uh, if COVID took the radio show out. Okay. And I was thinking it might take the radio show out because why? There were no sports going on. Mm -hmm. Nobody was buying tickets. Nobody was going to games. 
all that stuff was advertising dollars for the radio station. They only gonna take so many losses before they start to make other people feel that pain. Mm. And uh, I'll never forget it, man. I was jumping rope, and I said to myself, I wonder if I can write love stories. Um, I was like, yeah. And I was told my boy, I said, you know what, man? I'm supposed to go to a wedding tonight. I'm gonna give them a love story for a gift and see how it work out. And so uh, I told my, called my wife, said, hey, don't uh, don't buy them no gift. I'm giving them a love story. She's like, huh? I said, no, nah, I'm giving them a love story. And so I put it in the envelope. We get back from your honeymoon. Call me. I got a love story for you. Call me. Went and interviewed him. Uh, wrote it up. Framed it. Gave it to him. And took a video when I gave it to him. And they loved it. Put the video on Facebook. Had about 10 orders the next day. Wow. And I said, all right, I could do this. Mm. And that was kind of the beginning of the JJT Media Group. Okay, okay. And so, one thing I can say, how do you stay connected? Like, you, you've you been doing sports forever. Football, right? Right. And how do you stay, like, you, you are, it's a part of you. Do you just get up and just feel like, okay, I'm going to stay in tune with it in case I have to write stories on it? No, I, go out, I go out to the star every Wednesday and Thursday. And just go out and just go out there and talk to the players? And, you uh, always do that? Yeah, every Wednesday, every Thursday. How long you been doing that? Uh, for the most part, of the last twenty eight years. <laughs> wow, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's why I'm trying to because you stay, I mean, you stay, you connected because you always been there. Yeah, but what happens is, I mean, you know, you have different. You come at it from a different angle. When I when I was first getting started, and I was a beat reporter. Well, then I was out there every day. Now I do a podcast called Jock Talk. Yeah, Jock uh, Talk. Jock Talk is. I want to get into that. We're gonna get into that every uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you need material for that. So I go out there. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with um, Anscape. They're one of my clients. Uh, used to be the undefeated. And so they want stories from time to time. So you just have to. Then I do. I work with uh, Nui Scruggs on Friday, on Sunday nights during football season a lot of time. So I do the Media Match podcast with DallasCowboys.com. So what I'm saying is. That's hard. You do a lot of stuff. So you need to stay immersed in it. And then, you know, I spend most mornings doing a couple hours of reading just to see what's up. That's hard though. That ain't hard. No, I mean, I, not hard in a good way. Damn, Jock. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a great thing to see, like how you stay knitted and really just stay in the mix of it. You got a chemistry with that. Well, I mean, I mean, in a lot of ways, it ain't no different than you, dog. It's, it's about an evolution. You just have to evolve. Yeah. I'm still doing a lot of the same things, but do a lot of different things, and so I like it because it keeps your mind fresh, gives you a, a different way to look at the world. Because not everything I do is sports. Yeah. Um, but the Cowboys are going to always be the epicenter because the Cowboys sell whether they're winning or whether they're losing. People want to know about them. People have a hurt. You hear that? Have a thirst and a hunger for them. And so there's a reason why this week uh, ESPN put out the stuff about Stephen A. Smith put out just the most watched, most views they've had. Why? Because the Cowboys imploded. And so they, now literally, so they spent two days talking about the Cowboys implosion. That's the two biggest days they've ever had. Wow. That ain't no coincidence. That's why they talk about him all the time. Stephen A. Smith. Boy, that, how, have you ever met him? Come on, man. That's your boy? Yeah. I mean, well, I you, mean, like, as I like to say, if I saw him walking down the street, he say, hey, dog, what's up, man? How you yeah. doing? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I got his number, but I don't call you don't him. don't call him. But but I seen he fell out with uh with another guy. What was the little old short heavy set guy be on everybody? What's his name? Whitlock. What is? Yeah, is, is every, it? everybody fall out with Whitlock. Guys. Whitlock be cutting up, don't he? I uh -huh. I just see you know you see the biggest views right? right. Something that goes crazy on the internet. I would have never Jason his name right. Yeah. I would have never even thought about him because I don't even watch it like that. You right, know what right, I mean? Right. But it, the views and the, and it just pops up. It, they share it more. Yeah. I said, damn, what happened with these two? And you see these people going at it, and it ain't, it's like the gloves off. You know how you, right, right, right. usually the gloves on. Right. But have you ever had an incident where you had an issue with somebody that just spilled outside of just a player, but another journalist like that? Yeah, but it wasn't, um, I didn't make it a public thing. Okay. I mean, Stephen A could do that because he make eight digits. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jason Whitlock can do that because he makes close to seven if he don't make seven. Yeah. I was around six. I didn't feel comfortable. I was low six. I didn't feel comfortable being in a spotlight like that. Um, but yeah, I've had um, I've had some feuds with some people. Uh, most of my high profile stuff was with players, though. Yeah, you know, okay. Whether okay. it was Roy Williams, whether it was Dez Bryant. I remember the Dez Bryant one. And you know, a lot of that is, and I get it. So it's for the moment. 
the truth ain't always what you want to hear. I mean, it's just not. Um, and so if you write the truth enough, then people get upset. Yeah. But yeah. the truth is the truth. I mean, Doesn't it change. is what it is. And you can be mad about it if you want to. But at the end of the day, it's the truth. Yeah. And yeah. you can have reasons for why the truth happened. You can have reasons why you caught two passes for six yards. Yeah. But the bottom line is what you catch. Two passes for six yards. yards. Or if you have a bad year and you're getting roasted every week, you can be mad about that. But what's the facts? you having a bad year and you're getting roasted every, every week. week. It's not my fault. That's real. So... Jock talk, like like when you when you first decided to do jock talk, how did you go about laying it out? Like I'm gonna put it on. Where is it gonna stream at? How did you come up with the concept of what it you were gonna do? do? Oh, it's real easy, man. I mean, again, the business about evolution. So my boy Matt McLaren, okay, we got laid off from ESPN. We got a top ten show. They didn't want to lay us off. It's the business, mm -hmm. and so they told us, hey, if y'all gonna do something, you can use the next two months to promote it. So we had create, we like, oh, we got a radio show that's popular. We got a fan base. Let's create a podcast. And we had the podcast ready to go the day after the radio show ended. Mm. And so me and Matt did the podcast. Uh, I think we did probably about 350, 400 episodes. Um, two years, two and a half years. But it wasn't Jock Talk then. It was, no, it was called Jam Session. Okay, Jam Which was the name of our radio show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then Matt. Uh, at the time we were doing the podcast, he was he had gotten a full time job in Birmingham with his own radio show, daily radio show, uh, called the Matt McLaren Show. And um, when Norm Hitzkiss retired in Dallas, it made sense. The ticket called him because the ticket owned operated ESPN Radio. So the same people who were the bosses at the ticket, they were the bosses of ESPN Radio. So they mm. called him and said, "Hey, Hitzkiss is gone. We'd love for you to replace him." So he replaced him, moved back to Dallas. But you can't do a full time podcast. And a full time radio show, Conflict of Interest. Mm -hmm. The radio show not gonna let you do that. So I, that podcast ended. Um, I wanted to keep on having a voice in the media, uh, having a voice, and I like doing radio or podcasting. And so uh, it took me about six weeks to figure out how I wanted to do the show, how I was gonna produce it, where I was gonna do it, all that stuff. And so that's really the name of Jock Talk. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking: should I call it something else, or should I just continue with the Jam Session brand? Yeah, since it was already established. Uh, and I still vacillate a little bit about that, but long term, I think Jacques Talk will work because I have a name in the market, and uh, I think it's we're gonna the, continue to grow. I think that was the best decision. It, it's it's like uh, it, it. I sometimes think about that at Boss Talk One One. It's like I see the ones that's doing their name, like Joe Rogan, and right. like you said, uh, Joe Budden or, or Jock Talk. I'm like, dang, but that's that still could be a branch off with Boss Talk too. So it's just once you work in it, and then we doing the visuals a lot, so that. Right. that I'm, I'm working. <laughs> Dog, yes. <laughs> working is the name of the game. However you get it done, it's still working. Yeah, yeah. So so I, when does the episodes come out? Every uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Every Monday, Wednesday, 5 Friday. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. That's when they drop. Yeah. And when they drop, it's going down. Yeah. How many downloads are you getting? You getting some good ones? Yeah. Uh, you know, again, um, we just getting started with it. Uh, I do it with a guy named uh, Joe Hartfield. Okay. I call him Big Joe in the Big Rig. Cause he used to drive a truck. Okay, um, he's he's been a, he's been a friend of mine for about thirty years, and so it's a different. It's the same type of show, but it's a different kind of show because me and Matt were professional partners. We got along great. We friends. Yeah, me and Joe are boys. So it's different between friends and boys. Nah, you know, because yeah. uh, Joe say stuff to me, Matt would cringe. He was like, "I can't believe he talked to you like that." Man, and I'm like. That's because he know me. He think he can say these things. Yeah, but it's I, all good. It's all love. I just I enjoy the fact of how you, it's straight to you. It's, it's like direct to consumer. It's like it's yours. Your you're independent. Oh uh, yeah. It's a it's a whole different feel. Did you have something? I seen you stood up over there. No, I was just thinking, but um, I want to go on the Cowboys because <laughs> um, their last game after after they lost, um, sadly, um, the speech that the owner made. How did you feel about that speech? Cause he was in tears. Oh, you mean just about him being floored and mm -hmm. I mean, everybody was there. I could see them losing. I don't think anybody saw them getting blown out. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and you know, everybody's trying to analyze why they got blown out this or that. And a lot of it is just, they just succumbed to the pressure. Mm. Uh, you know, we've been saying forever, pressure make pipe bust. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they busted. Uh, and if you listen to, uh, there's some clips going around the internet of Green Bay's pregame speech out on the field right before the kickoff. And the running back, Aaron Jones, is like, come on, let's take let's take the ball, punch these MFs in the mouth, and let's go. 
called them front runners. And that's what they did. They got the ball. They went to kick off, 12 plays, 75 yards, seven minutes, punched them in the mouth, went up seven, nothing, and that was it. Cowboys folded. And they wilted. And, uh, you know, that's, you could talk about what they need to do. What they really got to do is they got to find some heart. <laughs> That's because real. some people work good under pressure, actually excel under pressure. It's just that the Cowboys don't. Yeah, uh, that's the name of the game. And so uh, I think they have a mental, I think they feel a lot of pressure, all this talk. And, we, uh, you know, people have different opinions of it, which is cool. But all this talk about, uh, you know, it's been 28 years since uh, they went to a championship game and this or that. That ain't really got nothing to do with Mike McCarthy. He's been here four. Yeah. You know, Dak been here eight. And so 28 years ain't got nothing to do with them. But if you in if you allow that thing to sit on you like that, that weight, like you like you do carry it, then it can affect you. And it looked to me like they got affected by the pressure because they played tight. They didn't play loose. And by the time they loosened up, game was over. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and they did so good at home all season. That's what that's why it makes. That's why it feels like it's the pressure that got to them and the mental part, not the physical part. How much, um, how much winning a game depends on the quarterback? Well, I mean, most of it does. But Dak did not play well. Uh, he played poorly. But everybody else played poorly. Defense didn't give him no chance. I mean, every, there's nobody on that in that game. Maybe Jake Ferguson's who played good. Everybody else they stunk. So, mm. you so know. you can't. Nobody can just really point their finger at one individual. No, but player. quarterback makes the most money. He gonna get the most blame, whether right. it's deserved. Just like he get yeah. the credit, whether it's deserved. It come. Ain't nobody feeling sorry for Dak and his $40 million check. So nobody it, com- it come with the deal. You know, you get the praise, you get the blame. That's he's, why you want to be a quarterback. He's – is he the same as Romo, you think, or better? Right now, they're probably about the same. They're really, really good. They just haven't done it in the playoffs. Because everybody used to be like, man, Tony Romo's a – he's a almost a professional golfer. He's – uh He's such an accurate, he's good, but then we could never win. Well, it's all relative. You win it, you're just not winning championships. That's real. I mean, you know, so I think Stephen A said the other day, you know, he's talking about Mike McCarthy. What's he talking about? He knows how to win. He only won one Super Bowl. Dog, it's hard to win Super Bowls. Definitely hard to win Super Bowls. I mean, Bowl. Tom Landry, who we think is like the greatest, one of the greatest ever, he won two in 30 years. Two. Wow, two. In 30 years. But we'd say he's a great coach. So it's hard to win. Um, you know, are you a winner if you're Mike McCarthy? I think he got uh, 11 10 win seasons. He got six 12 win seasons. Uh, He's been in the playoffs a bunch of times. He got a Super Bowl. Yeah, he knows how to win. What he got to do is figure out how to get this particular team over this mental hump that they have. Because it, it appears to me now to be mental. And the only way you get through a mental hump is you just got to bear down and fight through it. And I'm, I have a hypothetical question because I've been saying this a lot. Because uh, um, I would love to see this happen. That's the reason why I'm saying this a lot. <laughs> but um, I know you're friends with Dion. Do you see no. it? <laughs> Dion, Dion, don't want you for that. Dion does not want to coach. That's pro what players. I wanted to know. It, does he want to do that? No, Dion likes. What's the name of the book, though? Uh, Dion Sanders is a uh, coach. Prime Dion Sanders and the making of men. The making of the that's making what he of likes. men. So he's like the teacher who likes to deal with elementary school kids because he wants to get them when they're young, right? And, right. You know, and develop them into right. What they he likes to be. dealing high school kids and now college kids. Mm-hmm. He don't like to deal with pros. He will never. He coach would never, you. even after getting tired of that. He will never that. coach in the NFL ever. Ever. The one thing I've learned about life: never say never. That's his word, not mine. <laughs> well, tell him for me: never say no. never. You can never say never, but. You know what you like and what you don't like. At the moment. No, nah, because the NFL, you coaching grown men with egos, you ain't going to never like that. Mm. Never. So. But then, you know what? I? But some of the men that he's, the boys or the men that he's coaching right now but you to can't be get that. A, but you can't get a team of that. You're going to always have to deal with that other group. In college, yeah, cause I'm about to pick, say they could have, in college could. you pick your team. Mm-hmm. You pick all the guys on your team you have picked. But some of these men that he's training now will become NFL Players, yes, but some of them he hadn't trained. I mean, if he got, if he has one or two players a year, maybe three who go to the NFL, that's a lot. That's only three players every year, three or four players every year. He's not. Nah, he ain't. I'm sorry, he ain't never coaching in the league. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see him at Cowboys coach so, so bad. Let, let's talk about the book a little bit. Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, and the making of men. Sean Jock Taylor. Um, Let's just talk about that, John. Um, when you think about what, what made you put this picture on here, and where was this at? 
I mean, why you give me all that credit, man? I wrote the words. I didn't who pick put the, this? Who put the? Who picked the picture? Yeah, the editors picked the picture. So you ain't had no say. So you had to okay it? No, I didn't. You didn't? No. I need to learn how I mean, to give me a book. I mean, you you they ask your opinion. That's right. And if I hated it, they might have changed it. But I was like, I just want. It I do. Good. I do what I do. They do what they do. Yeah. I yeah. write. They edit. We they work. Edit. We work together like that. Okay. One reason I'm successful is I let people do what they do. Do what they do. I can understand that. Let and me I tell them, I don't want you telling me how to write. I'm not going to tell you how to put the cover together and all this other stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. So well, let me ask you this: When you first went to do this, when you said I'm going to do this book, what was the first thing that you thought that you would have to do? What do you mean? What was the first steps in doing this book? Did you go? Where was Dion at the time? Oh well. How long did it take you to compile it, right? But not even just that. How long, okay, when did you get the idea to say that I want to do this? Oh, okay, that requires a backstory. Yes. So I had, uh, one of my clients has been um, ESPN's Anscape, undefeated for a couple years. And how long ago was this? Uh, That you're recalling back to? Probably 2021. Okay, keep going. And so I started, when he first got to, um, first got the job, I started writing stories for uh, Anscape about him at Jackson State. And then um, Anscape called me and said, hey, we really like the angles that you're taking. Why don't you just cover them like a beat in year two, which is like 2022. And so at the end of the 22 season, I got a, at the 21 season, I got a call from Sports Illustrated that said, hey, we hear that you have a, uh, as good a relationship as anybody with Deion Sanders. Would you write a cover story for uh, Sports Illustrated for us? And I was like, heck yeah, that's on my bucket <laughs> list of things to do. And so I wrote the story, and literally two days after the story came out, um, the, the editors at HarperCollins called me and said, hey, we've been looking for somebody to write a Dion book for two years. Are you interested? Wow. And so I said, yeah, let me check with, uh, let me check with Prime, see what he says. And so I called him and said, hey, here's an opportunity I have. Here's how much money they're talking about paying me. What do you think? He's like, I got you, my brothers. Whatever access you need, you got. Wow. And so uh, it was funny is, you know, people spend a lot of time trying to get book deals and hire agents and all this stuff, man. That happened on a Friday. On Monday, I talked to the editor again. She said, hey, I'm going to have you talk to my boss on a Tuesday. Talked to her and her boss on a Tuesday. And she, when I got off the phone, she's like, we're going to have a contract for you tomorrow. And so uh, they had a contract for me. All this happened in about four days. Yeah. And when did you start writing? All of that was around June, and so I went down to Jackson in uh, August and stayed until December. So wow. that's how long it took you to write the book? No, that's how long it took me to report it. To report it, to and get then, the information uh, together. Writing it, I probably started writing in uh, January, turned it in in uh, April, so about three months. Wow. Okay. The crazy part about it is, uh, okay, when you get down, you went down to Jackson, right? How, how was that? You know, Jackson's interesting. It's not as bad as I thought. Uh, I mean, I thought... You know, what's funny is I thought I was going to be dealing with a, with a bunch of racism all the time, every day, because it's Jackson. Now, I will tell you, I did get stopped driving while black <laughs> less than 48 I hours into Jackson. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, because uh, I had a... I had, Were you time, speeding? You know what? I was not speeding. <laughs> no, I really wasn't because I saw the officer, and, but I wasn't... Here's why I got stopped. I, have a, I had a white Camaro. It was a convertible, and I had only had it for about two months, and so it still had paper plates on it. And so I saw the officer, and I was making a U-turn on the highway, you know, going across to the other side because I was going to Target. So I, I literally saw the officer, so I knew I wasn't speeding. I was doing a U-turn. Can't do a U-turn fast anyway. And he whoop, whoop. I go, you know, and I was like, what, 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 what's the deal? Uh, and he told me something about the paper tags because I knew I hadn't violated anything. <laughs> and uh, we had a BS talk. And then he, he let me go. But outside of that, I didn't really deal with much uh, racism, not nearly as much as I thought in Jackson. And you know why? Because Jackson is what? 80% black. That's right. So, no, nah, it ain't Jackson where you had to worry about it. It's probably outside of Jackson you got issues. But in Jackson, not really a problem. Um, I did deal with the whole water issue like yeah. everybody else, uh, like my toilet. I had an Airbnb downtown. Oh, yeah, that water was messed Dog, up. The toilet did not work. The three months I was there. Like, Damn. I had to put water in the tank and flush it every time. Uh, but in general, outside of that, man, Jackson was okay. I don't have anything bad to say about Jackson. Jackson was okay with the water. You was in, 
Man, that water, I know in, we, when we came to Vicksburg, I think it was. Yeah, it's about I, 40 miles from Jackson. Yeah, I didn't, I, I wasn't drinking no water. I was like, <laughs> no. Nah. That was when the water thing was, it was a rumor no. that you guys was having water issues down no, there. Man, they weren't. Trying to put him down there with them. No? You know, they, wouldn't have, they didn't have water at the, uh, at the restaurants, uh, you know, they give you. They didn't have water. They'd offer you soda out the can because yeah. you can't mix it. Yeah. So but it, it makes was, you wonder, okay, because whenever I'm cooking, I gotta wash my meat. I gotta do all of that. So what do they use to do all of that sort boil of stuff? Boil water first. Yeah, you gotta boil use it a lot first. of bottled water. I mean, it was. Uh, That's expensive using a lot of bottled water for stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, uh, it was a real deal. How was the how was the players in the in the atmosphere of where everybody was at? Um, it was fine because you know I spent most of uh, most of my time literally while I was in Jackson was at the football facility. Yeah, and because Dion uh, blessed me with access to the entire program, and I had knew I knew several coaches on the team before I got there because they had worked with him at TC Trinity Christian City Hill. Yeah, or at the Truth Organization, or they had played for the Cowboys, so I knew several of them, and. Um, you know, so they were happy to see me. And then the other guys were like, okay, who are you and why do you have this access that we ain't never seen coach <laughs> get nobody else? And so I was like, well, you know, I covered him when he was with the Cowboys. We cool, yeah, this or that. And so, you know, if he going to co-sign, then they're going to co-sign until you do something to make them mad. And so Dion's days, he's an early guy, meaning a lot of football players practice in the afternoon. He likes his practices in the morning. So he had a team meeting every morning at uh, – it start when he show up, so you need to be in your seat when he shows up, which is any time between 7.05 and 7.15. So let's just say the meeting started at 7.05. And so I would get there about 6.55, and I would just be there most days until about 2.30 or 3. And then, you know, you go home and take, write some notes over, uh, go back to the hotel, the Airbnb, write some notes about all the things you saw. Because a book like this is really – a, uh, an observational book. You're doing a lot of observational reporting. You're just sitting there watching what's happening. How's he interacting? What are the players saying? And then as, as the season starts to un unveil itself and you see who's going to, to uh, be a big deal, who's going to be important, who's going, who, are, who the stars are, then you start talking to them. And then just try to weave it all together into something that makes sense. <laughs> wow. The thing I, I, I think about you being down there, and I'm just walking my way through it. Um, when you when when you're down there, you don't have a clue that he's going to leave there. No. Nah. And, and so that's why I say a lot of it's observational. Now, I started getting a clue about midway through the season because, again, me and Dion are cool. Yeah. And so we had it. But he's also working. Like, I'm doing my job, which is writing a book. He's doing his job, which is coaching the football team. Um, and so I didn't really talk to him all that much because what? He working. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I would talk to him uh, regularly. He had production meetings with ESPN every Thursday. And so usually after those meetings were over, he would unwind for a little bit and I might chat, chop it up with him for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and about midway through the season, I got the feeling that I think he's not for long. Wow. And that's because, you know, Dion, Dion is. Um, he been rich and powerful for a long time, like since 1989. That's a long time. Rich people do what they want to do. Dion has always been a guy, always, who says, if you create drama in my life or distractions in my life, I get rid of you. Mm. And so once he, and it doesn't matter whether you agree with him, this is just how he operates. And so once he decided that the administration was not riding with him all the way, he was like, well, if I get another opportunity, I'm going to go. Wow. And so um, that's really what happened. Now, he, now understand, he was never going to stay there forever. Of course. Because he was going to outgrow it at some point. But I think he would have stayed longer had he been able to get along with Thomas Hudson and the administration. He'd have stayed longer. But instead, he thought they were messing with him. And he was just like, okay, fine. I'm going to bounce. Wow. But with all the observations that you were doing while you were there, because you've known Dion for a very long time, um, was some of that information like, oh, I already know that, I already know this type of thing, or was it all no, new for you? It was you? all new because I had never seen him in a college, in a college uh, atmosphere, and so, you know, it's a, it was a really interesting book. It was a really interesting time to write because as much as I know about football, I've never ever been granted full access to a program. Like I was at the team meeting every morning, I was at t every team dinner the Friday night before a game. I was in the locker room at halftime and before and after every game. 
Um, I was in meeting rooms listening to them prep their players for particular games, whether it was the offensive line or the secondary, the quarterbacks. And so I remember telling him one time, like, duh, as much as I know, man, I didn't learn so much just about how teams operate. And then I remember telling him one time, I said, duh, I can't believe you give me full access to the program. I can go wherever I want to go, talk to anybody I want to talk to, and there's still a hundred things going on that I ain't got no idea about. <laughs> and he started laughing. He said, welcome to my life. Yeah. Because, you know, some kid has always got an issue. There's always some administrative thing going on. There's always some coach thing going on. There's always something going on with the team. And all these things are going on. And I was right there in the middle of it. And still, there were all these things that I had no idea about until a week or two later. Wow. That's that's something else. But that just shows that, you know, his heart was all the way into it. If he in it, he in it. Oh, yeah, man. He loves coaching. He loves working with men. He's very competitive. He loves winning. Yeah. Um, and that's why ultimately he'll win in Colorado. Now, you think he'll win over there? He will. Because I, because it's um, he's always going to be able to recruit a certain amount of talent because he's charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to put, be able to put the kind of staff together that can win. And so you know, I tell this story often. I was uh, going to interview his son Shiloh one day. And uh, I'd been trying to get with Shiloh for a few weeks. And I finally walked into, uh, and they were on the road somewhere, and Shiloh was eating a Caesar salad by himself. And I said, hey, is this a good time? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sat down, we chopped it up. And the last thing I said was, hey, I got a question for you, dog. Why your, why your daddy win everywhere he go? At Truth, at Cedar Hill, went into Jackson State. And he was eating a salad, and he looked up at me, and he said, because he always got the best players. And he <laughs> sat back down and started eating the salad again. <laughs> and, my, and the whole thing was, that's why he'll win in Colorado because at a certain point, he's going to have the talent to win because college football is not complicated, man. Why does Alabama win all the time? They got better players than everybody else. And then That's you real. throw coaching in it. Why do my boys, Ohio State, win all the time? They got better players. And then you add the coaching, they win. I mean, the same thing. I got to ask you about his boys, like his sons. You've been around him so long. You, you remember each one of them growing up. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like what when you see those in the chemistry that he have, and that being a father and working with his kids like he do, it's got to be an incredible thing, you know, because they're, they have such an eye on them, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think, now, yes, you are correct. But another level, man, and uh, I've mentioned this to him a couple times. Uh, it was early on in our relationship, and maybe we've been talking for, uh, I don't know, this was probably 1998 or so, so he'd been, I'd known him for two or three years, but we had only really gotten to the point where I would call him, you know, for a year or so. And I remember distinctly, man, calling him at his house for whatever I was working on. And we were talking. He said, hey, Shock, hold up a second, man. And he pulled the phone away. He's like, ah! <laughs> Yelling at his kids. He said, okay, I'm back. And I started laughing. <laughs> he said, what you laughing at? I said, dog, you ain't no different than me, man. <laughs> Pull the phone away. Yell at your rug rash to quit doing what they're doing. Quit acting a fool because I'm on the phone. And now you back to your car. He said, Yeah. <laughs> and so my point is he ain't no different than any other involved father. father that's real he ain't no better he's the same as every involved father and the difference is you don't see most college coaches uh, most of the time their sons don't play for him yeah that's right you know but you know he's also involved with his daughter uh, Bossy that's yeah, her nickname I seen, I seen her on one she plays basketball at Colorado he yeah. goes to her practices from time to time he goes to all her games you know, the ones he in town for. Yeah. He's an involved father for her. He give her pep talks. You say you want to be great. How much you been in the gym this week? He be on him. Bossy. Have you put in all the work you could put in? You ran the mile of the warm-up conditioning drill in XX time. Is that the best you could do? Can you do better? He do that same thing with her that he do with his boys. He's an involved father. father. Ain't no coinkin' dink, dog. You can say what you want to about Dion them the player or the personality, you think it's a coincidence that both his sons play for him? His daughter played basketball there and his, and his oldest, oldest boy, son he, he does all the social media? You think yeah. that's a coincidence? That yeah. ain't no coincidence. thing. No. They He's been be a around. strong father as when they were growing up and so guess what? They like being around their dad. You know, I tell my son um, who's 20 now, I told him this probably about three or four weeks ago. We were shooting pool. I said, you know what, man? You're my son. I love you. But I like you too, though. That's real. That's you real. Know? And because it's true. And so 
We hang out. Why? Because I like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't like all your kids. No, no, no. Everybody, no. not for real. Everybody don't like all their kids. No, I, I, I have, I have my, some di- them, my time. Some of them give you more trouble than others. Yeah, yeah. But some of them, you just like this kid right here. They handle their business. They do everything they're supposed to do. <sighs> you know, I like this one. Yeah, <laughs> you love them all. You don't like them all. You love them all. You don't always like them all. I but, gotta ask you about uh. Down there, do you think when the, when he did end up leaving, it affected those 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 kids? Some of those kids came there because Dion was going to be there. Every every, I'm not going to say every player. Most players go to a college because they riding for the coach. Yeah, but the way Dion is electrifying, man. Most many coaches are electrifying. Not like Dion sounds. I would I'm, what I'm saying is I would frame it differently. I would say the city felt even more than the players. Like the wow. players understand what the game is. Uh, but it's the city which hadn't had a lot to cheer for, hadn't had a lot of hope, hadn't had a lot of good things happen to it. Now, here we are. We got this one good thing here. They bring in making Jackson State relevant again. College game day is here. 60 Minutes is here. They throwing love All to Jackson. All the rappers coming down there. Right. People, people in our city, we can walk around proud, head high. Where you from? I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> you know yes. what I'm saying? Yeah. Because in the past, maybe it was, where you from? I'm from Jackson. Jackson. Low. Nah, it's not from Jackson. Yeah. Jackson State. Yeah. Home of the Tigers. Yeah. You know, Dion, <laughs> Sonic Boom. You know yeah, what's up? Yeah, yeah. Well, now that's gone. Well, I mean, you still got the Sonic Boom. They still doing their thing. But when J- he made Jackson the epicenter of college football, you can, you can try to deny that, but it's true. Just like what he doing now. He made Colorado. Colorado is up there with views and watching the same as Alabama and Ohio State, which is crazy. Wow. Uh, it's real and it's crazy. all because of him and the, and the electricity that he brings any program that he's with. And uh, what I tried to capture in the book is really give you an essence of who he is and what he's all about. Like when you read the book, um, you will feel like you're at Jackson State. Wow. And it's because of the access that he gave me. Like I take you there. And so you feel it when he's giving them pep talks. You feel it when he's telling people, this is what it takes to be great. Are you willing to pay that price? If you're not, let me know. I'll quit pushing you. Uh, but all of those things are in there. Did, okay, so the book is all, he was in Jackson the whole time when, when you wrote the book. The book is about the 2022 season. Got it. It ain't about 2021, 2020, when he showed up. It's about the 2022 season from start to finish. And that includes uh, a little bit of time in Colorado. Okay. Because uh, obviously he was doing that and transitioning to Colorado at the end of the year. So it talks about that. But it talks about his decision making process, it talks about his relationship with the president wow. and why, how that ultimately um, led him to leave. And I talked to the president and I asked him some tough questions wow. about his relationship with, the pres- with, with Dion and uh, how it went south. Now, you know, you can, you can, as I like to say, I asked a question, he gave the answer. You can, take, you can judge it for yourself and well, form your own opinion. When you when you go from Jackson to, to Colorado, it's night and day. When you look at the way that the facilities are set up, well, yeah. Uh, now Ashley Robinson, the um, athletic director at Jackson State, does a phenomenal job. Like really, he's I think my opinion, he easily the best AD in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Okay, one of the best ADs in the country. Why? Because he, 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 bought, he got Prairie View all new facilities before he went to Jackson State. Wow. Um, he does a phenomenal job. He got Dion to Jackson State. That tell you what kind of dude he is. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, they got good facilities and everything, but they're not a power five. So, yeah, Colorado got more stuff. Uh, Colorado got bells and whistles. But, um, you know, it's, it's a different place. It's supposed to be better from a facility standpoint than Jackson State. These kids playing with money now, right? They they getting bread. They should. Okay. How much does that change the way the game is being played? This is my opinion. I think ultimately, my opinion, it'll probably drive him, Dion, out of the game. You think so? And here's why. Um, Dion makes a very distinct difference between pay for play, which is I'm just going to pay you because you showed up, and endorsement deals like he thinks you should get as many endorsement deals as as you can handle if boss talk is so popular that people want to give you money 
more power to you because you done bought out on the field and your reward is companies want you to endorse their products. That's different than you got a scholarship to Colorado, let me give you 50 grand. Mm. Now he draws the difference between that. He said, if we got rid of the collectives, this is me paraphrasing Dion. If we got rid of the collectives and just made it all NLI, whatever jersey sales you get, name and image likeness that you, Boss Dog, generate, more power to you. If that's five hundred dollars, if it's five thousand, if it's five hundred thousand, all good. Got no problem with that. What he doesn't like is the collectives who just pay you just because you showed up to play at Colorado. Yeah, or while we recruiting, you know, recruiting used to be, hey, can I start if I come to your school? Well, we're going to let you compete. And if you better than everybody else, yes, sir, you can start. Now, the first question out of their mouth is, how much, how much y'all offering? Because this school offered me 500000 to come. This school offered me 550000 What y'all offering? Wow. Now, some people, I said this real talk, man. On Boss Talk. Hey, one on one with a boss is talk. <laughs> <laughs> Some people will be like, I want my kid to play for Deion Sanders, or I want my kid to play before he retired for Nick Saban. Yeah. Or I want my kid to play for Jim Harbaugh. Uh, if you're going to give us some money, we'll take it, but that ain't our number one deal. We want to play for you. You put cats in the NFL, you, grow, you turn young men and young boys into men. That, we want to play for you. It's going to be some other people like, we want the money. We love you, but Alabama, Ohio State, Michigan offered us 1.2. You offering 500,000. That's not happening. Mm. And that's just the way it is, man. Wow. And so I think at some point, he might get tired of that and yeah. be like, I just don't need a headache. I'm going back to coach high school. Yeah. Or I'm just going to coach my youth league. Yeah, because Because yeah. I don't want all that headache. I, I used to hear when, when he was do coaching Little League and playing Snoop Dogg and all kind of stuff. Right. So they had fun doing that. You know what I mean? And that's the, the, the you, you, I know he got some stories about that. You know what I mean? Because that, that was just the kids, you know. And, that, and some of those kids are in, in, in the league now, some right? Of them, some of them playing at Colorado. In Colorado. Dylan Epp was the running back is playing in Colorado. And he been, um, he been, I forget the young man's name. He played with my son at DeSoto. He played for Truth. He's at... Um, Colorado, so it's crazy. So no, nah, he's uh, he's having fun, man. That's and and that's something else because what he's doing, I bet a lot of them had never done that before. Couldn't they? Well, some of them have maybe coached the league. Not from youth, no. Nah, not from youth. Not from youth to high school to to college, no. Nah. No, nah, and and I'm telling you, I, and I tell you, a junior, Deion Sanders Jr. That boy, listen, he do good with all of the media stuff. Uh, I, I be I like the way he do it. I I done met him a few times. And I be he's like, uh, we call him Bucky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's his nickname. That's what the people in his family called him, uh, or they call him Junior. Uh, Bucky's a good dude, man. Yeah, a good dude, smart dude, like really smart, uh, very driven. Yeah. Uh, and when when I say smart, because we had a conversation about this one time. <laughs> Uh, he had a clothing line. I know. I met him right during the time he had that uh, line. And when he had the clothing line. It was a we, goat. Yeah. Because we were talking about the difference between him and his dad, Shadur and his dad, and then Shiloh and his dad. <laughs> and he was like, me and Shadur, I'm pretty sure I got this story right. He said, me and Shadur, he said, if we're talking about my clothing line, me and Shadur would learn how to sew, how to pattern, how to do every single solitary thing ourselves so we would know how to do it. My dad and Shiloh would go pay somebody to do it. Yeah. He says, not good or bad. That's just the difference in us. He goes, every business I've ever had, I learned every single solitary thing about that particular business so I could do it for myself. He says, since I started doing this stuff with my dad, I done learned how to edit, I done learned how to do this, I learned how to do that so that I'm a one-man band. If I need to hire somebody, I can tell them exactly how to do it because I know how to do it. And because I know how to do it, I can tell him exactly how I want it done. But uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a really cool dude, man. I like to, I like to really talk to him because, yeah. um, uh, you know, I, I put him in a category of kind of wise beyond his years. Yeah. Uh, but he's a, he's a real good dude, and he is, he's a guy who chases greatness in whatever he does. Because you got to understand, man, real talk, it ain't easy growing up being Deion Sanders Jr. No. No. That's not easy. At all. I mean, one thing to be Shador Sanders or Shiloh Sanders, that's not easy either. 
But Deion Sanders Jr., <laughs> dog. <laughs> That is not easy, I, and he handled you. that thing like a Listen, champ. I met him in Vegas, and I when they said he was Deion Jr., I was like, I don't care. Deion played football. I, I'm not buying no clothes. I don't believe him. And then I seen him at the place the other day. We was down there on, on, messing with some clothes, right, and, right, right. and that was about a, probably about a year ago, and I was like, now I believe. It might be about a year, year and a half. Yeah. I was like, now I believe, because it's been like seven, eight years. Nah, right? man, he's a, he's but he authentic. really was in Vegas at Magic trying to learn about clothes. That's like, what I'm telling He's, he's really a- trying. Like, I've been doing this. I'm like, I see nah. him up here, and I'm thinking, oh, it's just clout. I'm like, oh, nah, this is just Dion's nah. son. And I went, he had a few guys around him, you know. Nah, but he really seemed like he really loved clothes. And let me tell you about Dion, man. Dion hold his kids to the same standard. That he hold his his athletes to his other players to, and so he hold Bucky to the same standard that everybody else that worked with him. So, because I talk about it at one point during the at the book, they having a team meeting and Bucky still doing the social media stuff, and he's supposed to have a highlight video, and it it ain't working right. They're like, Bucky, I'm finna count to five. This thing need to be good, and it didn't work. <laughs> he got he got yelled at like everybody else. <laughs> And uh, I asked him about it later, and he said, you know what my dad does, man? He said, my dad will push you to greatness. If you got it in you, if it's in you, he'll pull it out of you. Because it ain't never good enough. Yeah. And once you understand it ain't never good enough, before he even tell you, you out there trying to make it great Great. because you know his expectation is what? Great. Great. His expectation is never good. His expectation is great. great. And check this out. You can't work for him. If you don't embrace that, like he'll say, hey, boss, I want you to do this project for me. That's all he'll say. Here's what I need. Go do it. And if you bring back something basic, he's like, what is this? He expects you to understand that when I gave you this project, I wanted you to bring back greatness in it, whatever it was. And if you don't do that, he may tell you once or twice. But after that, dog, you either getting I saw him demote one of his good friends. But it wasn't bad. He said, uh, he said, hey, because uh, I was sitting there when he did it. He said, hey, you did the video. I appreciate the effort. It wasn't good enough. Bucky's in charge of the videos from here on out. And the guy looked at him and said, oh, well, let me try again. I'm going to make it better. He said, you've tried. You can't do what I want. This is Bucky's gift. He understands it. Not a knock on you. You tried the best you could. You're not good enough for this project. What you excel at is this. So I'm going to put you back over here where you do great work. And I'm going to put Bucky over here because this is where he does great work. Wow. And dude's, yeah, feelings, was, was. He was, feel, dude's feelings was hurt. And he was in his feelings for a day or so. And then I went back and talked to him later. I said, how'd you feel about that? He said, well, I was upset at first. But ultimately, he was right. Bucky's better at it than I am. What he got me doing right now, I really am great at it. And so it's all good. Wow. That's and that's I guess that's the part of being great, man. When when you used to see him running that ball back back in when he was running that ball, cause it was an exciting thing to see him go back and he did get this punt return. Everybody I ain't never seen nobody more exciting than him, even if they kick it away, because they didn't kick it to him every time. No, cause, yeah, cause no, they knew he had a, a chance uh, to run it back. You make a great point. Uh, I used to mess with him about it. I said, duh. You're the only dude I knew. <laughs> only dude I've ever seen. You know, most people go get some snacks, concessions. I was fourth down there for the punt. I'm finna go run over here, try to get these snacks before they get back with the ball. Now, dog, you're the only person I know. People are like, nah, I'm gonna wait till the punt is over. Make sure he don't take this thing back to the house. <laughs> And you know he had his whole thing. He back there waiting for the bunt. He got to oh, dance, he and then he got to put his oh, arms out. He's the best to do it, man. No, nah, I and mean, then he's like, yeah, it's, you know, and um, he's a great dude, man. A lot of people don't understand him. I understand him. Uh, he's a he's a great dude. He's well, a good dude. When it came to baseball and transitioning, like he was doing. You know, uh, you you seen that too when he was coming back and forth and going back into the league. You 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 didn't start dealing with him until he hit Cowboys. Though. Mm-hmm. But did he ever? And I can't remember. Did he go back into baseball any when he was yeah. with the Cowboys? Uh, just for very briefly. But the thing about it is, man, um, and if you uh, if you go back and look at the interviews and stuff, baseball teammates have a much different reaction to him than football teammates. 
Okay. Because in football, he the best in the world. I mean, he's a pro football Hall of Famer. That's for sure. He always been that dude in football, and he'll tell you that. Oh, you kick it to me, I'd probably take it to the house on you. In baseball, he's a different dude. One, he was a good baseball player. He was never that dude in baseball. He was really good, but he was never that dude. And so there's a humbleness about him in baseball that you'll never find in football. <laughs> and so in baseball, his teammates loved him in baseball, man, because he fit right in. He played cards. He talked trash. He's a humble guy in baseball because, as he would say, ain't nothing like trying to hit that curveball, man. <laughs> ain't nothing like trying to hit that curveball. And just when you think maybe you got a chance to hit the curveball, but at least you can hit the fastball. At least you can do that. He said, then you get Nolan Ryan on the mound, and you can't hit the fastball. Damn. And so, you know, it takes him to talk about baseball because he's such a competitor. Uh, what he loved about baseball is what? He couldn't master it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a challenge. It was a cha- he it, loved it was constant challenge. challenge. Yeah. I want to ask you, this book, you got, how many, you got almost, what you got, 300, how many pages in here? 300 and some. Can I tell you about that, dog? It's a good book, too. Now yeah. Here's why, let, me tell you, let me tell you why. Like, anybody who writes a book be like, no, nah, my book is good. Yeah. But no, nah, what happened was, I was like any writer, I had some anxiety once it came out, like, I think it's good. I hope it's good. But is it really good? Yeah. And so when I got them, I didn't even look at it for about a week or two because I was like, I don't want to open this, start reading it, and be like, this is a piece of shit. <laughs> but Dion read the draft before it went out? No. Nope. He didn't read it at all? No. Nope. And so I decided <laughs> I can't deal with this anxiety. I'm just going to read it. As so I picked it up, I, now of course I wrote it, so I read it, but I read it like I was reading it, not like I wrote it. I was like, I'll be dying. This is all right right here. And then I listened to the audio book the next week. I was like, oh, this thing tight. Wow. Were you happy with the voice of the audio book? Yes, because they sent me a list of five names. Now, I listen to a lot of audio books. Mm-hmm. Uh, they sent me five names. And once I looked up the names, because once I looked up the names, I discovered I was familiar with four of them. And so they said, hey, make your recommendation. We won't guarantee you that we'll pick yours, but we'll take it under consideration. And so I picked one, got named Corey Jackson, and uh, I sent it in. And then about a week or two later, they said, hey, we're going to go with Corey. And um, I thought it was a good choice, but let me tell you, that boy did that thing on that book. I'm going to have to check it out. No, I mean, when I say he did that thing, he did that thing on the book, man. Because that's what I prefer. I prefer audio books because I'm always on the go. And it's easy for me to just... That's why I listen to a lot of them. Right. No, he did that thing. The voices can mess up an audio book. You are correct because there have been a couple (laughs) of books. I just like, I can't deal with the dude's voice. Yeah. I I like, boom. Uh, Now, what's funny is Bobby Brown did his own book. And I almost gave up on that thing about three different times. (laughs) And it was him himself. Because his voice was so bad. And so I almost gave up on Bobby Brown. But but you finished it. But I finished it. Was it good? It was good because I finally got used to it. But his voice was very bad to me at first. <laughs> but Corey Jackson did that thing. Did on his it. Book. It's it. fire. Because he hit the inflections right. I mean, he just, it's just he just did a phenomenal job. What was so something? How, I want to ask him. What hold was, on, I want to talk about his book. Let Miss Jamaica too. talk. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> so she bring how long? Lucky red stripe up in here. <laughs> how long after um you read the book and the book came out did Dion read it or did he ever read it? You know, I uh, I don't know if he read it or not. He uh, would have called you and said, "Hey." Now what happened is, um, uh, right before they opened up the season against TCU, I took a trip out to Boulder. And I brought him a book, and I said, hey, I know your season about to start. Here's a book. I signed it for him. I said, hey, I appreciate everything you helped me do. Um, but it's about to, I'm about to start going out doing some publicity, talking about it. And so I just want to make sure you have one in case something pops up and somebody asks you about it. But uh, And I'm not that dude who'd be like, hey, man, how, how was it? How, <laughs> did you like it? Did you not like it? Uh, because Dion... His calling card is honesty. If he got a problem with you, trust me. He will call. He don't mind picking up the phone like, what's up? He don't mind doing that at all. That's real. I mean, like, not at all. So, yeah. you know, if he got a problem with you, he will let you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't want nothing. I was just basically asking what was it that you didn't get to put in the book that you wanted to put in the book or you thought about putting in the book? <sighs> nothing, really. So you, you got everything? Man, let me tell you something. I had never... 
I've written uh, this is my third book. I don't really count the first two because the first two were more were much more like a series of stories, like twenty different stories that were bound together. We called it a book. Mm-hmm. This is a start to finish. This is like a book, like a real book. Um, and what happened was they told me I had to write eighty thousand words. That's a little intimidating. Um, and I had never written one like this. So in September, I had written, a, in my mind, I had a couple of chapters. So I called my editor. I said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a chapter how I think the book is going to go. And uh, I'm going to send it to you, and you tell me if you get down with it, because this is how I'm going to write it. And I sent it to her, and she said, oh, this is great. I said, oh, okay, cool, we're good. <laughs> And so I wrote it in a certain style. Um, and so, you know, but when I finished it again, I sent, remember I told you, the book's supposed to be 80,000 words. I sent in 120,000. Mm. But in my mind, I was like, because I hadn't done it before, I'm going to send you everything. And then we kind of work through it, get it done. It's not a problem. And so after a couple of weeks, I hadn't heard from her. And she said, so I called her and said, hey, what's up? She said, Jacques, let me be honest with you. This is so massive. I just can't deal with it. It's too much. <laughs> I said, you need me to cut it? She's like, would you? I was like, girl, you should have just called me last week and told me that. <laughs> like, I'm a journalist. I can cut my own stuff. That's not a problem. So I cut it from 120 to 90. Well, yeah. And then I sent it back. I said, you good? She's like, oh, my God, Yes. And so uh, we ended up right around 85 or so. Um, and so, no, I got, got uh, everything in there. I got everything in there that I wanted to get in there. It's, uh, and what happens is in the book, because it's about a season, and in a the season there's characters in the season. And some of them are high-profile characters like Shadur and uh, Travis Hunter, and some of them are not high-profile like uh, Hayden Hagler, and uh, this guy named Amari. I can't remember Amari's last name. Uh, but what happens is, so, you know, they play in a different opponent every week. So say they play in Memphis in week two at the uh, whatever the bowl is in Memphis. Well, what happens is I write about the game and the stuff leading up to the game. And then say, Boss Talk makes a big play. Well, then when Boss Talk causes that fumble on third and two, I dip out. And I write about 2,000 words on who is Boss Talk. Mm. Here's his story. He showed up here and he went here. and he, This is how he ended up miss, at mm. uh, Jack State. Then I jump. Then I jump back into the game. And I might go another 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 words. And then, uh, you know, Miss Jamaica scored the winning touchdown. Then I, boom, I dip out and tell you Miss Jamaica's story. Wow. And then I bump back into the game, back into the season. And what's funny is uh, one of the reviews I got was, uh, it was like four stars, and, and a woman wrote, this is a really good book, it's a lot of information, but the person kept jumping out and talking about <laughs> this person and that person and then jumped back into the game. It was confusing to me. And I was like, but that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> and so, you know, and so she's like, that's why I gave it four stars instead of five, because it was confusing. Wow. And I just started laughing when I read that review because... No, that's what I was trying to do. Man, I'm telling you, man, I, I, I'm I want to read this book, man. You're going to enjoy Coach it, man, Prime, because... Deion Sanders and the Making of Men, man. You guys got to get this book. Get out and check it out, man. Hey, man, this guy right here, he knows more about Dallas for sure. <laughs> but Dion, that's his boy. They've been partners for a long time because of this 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 uh, pig skin. Some people have called me the right. Dion Whisperer, and I just be laughing. <laughs> But no, he's a good dude and a good friend. He's a good friend. I got a question about a book. So when I'm looking in the book and I looked at the contents, um, because the first thing I always do is look at the contents to see, okay, what is chapter one about? What is chapter two about? So forth. But I noticed you didn't do that. You only had chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. What was your reasoning behind that instead of actually giving us a little hint of what each chapter was about? To make you get in there and read it from start to finish. (laughs) And I did give you a hint at the start of every chapter. So like if you look at the chapters... Each chapter has a uh, has a quote in it from a person in the chapter that kind of tells you what the chapter's about. Okay. But it's a it's a story about the season. So it literally starts with Media Day um in Birmingham, Alabama, 
where the season kind of officially kicks off. That's where it starts. And it takes you all the way through, not just the Celebration Bowl in December in Atlanta, but then I bought, I, I went back to Jackson for the spring game, and I went out to Colorado after Dion had kind of set up out there and wrote kind of an epilogue about here's what's happening at Jackson State once he left, here's what's happening in Colorado once he arrived. Wow. Uh, when he got to, when that game at TCU you mentioned earlier, when they won that, um, how was that for you? Did you? I know every, it surprised everybody, and it was a yeah, lot. I was hey, really, the hype was real at that point. No, nah, I was really, uh, I was really happy for him because uh, you know there's so many haters out there, man. And hater, just for I mean, a lot of people use hater; they don't use it in the right way. Hate. If somebody's hating on you, it's unjustified criticism. That's what hate is: unjustified criticism. Some criticism is justified. That's not hate. That's just criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Unjustified criticism <laughs> is hate And that's what he got a lot of man And you know why? Because he's unapologetically black And he don't give a damn what you think about it <laughs> A lot of people say they care He literally doesn't care And so he took a lot of hate man uh, You know a lot of white folks uh, Mad at him because He does things his way His way is you know, a lot of people don't really even understand. Like, why is he on Instagram? What does that matter? Where are kids, where do kids hang out? Instagram. Duh. All day long. Where do the recruits, the players that he wants, where do they hang out? Instagram. They don't hang out on Twitter. Mm -mm. They hang out on the ground. IG, that's right. That's where they hang out. That's it. That's where he communicates. That's good stuff. No, that's, I mean, and so he gets it. He understands. It. He like me, man, in this sense. I go in the locker room. I can't figure out, you know, I'm 57. I know I don't look it, baby. But it's, <laughs> you look good, It man. is what it is. John Taylor is 57, <laughs> y'all. He just gave it up. I thought he was going to lie and say he was 51. <laughs> uh, so check this out. So you trying to, I'm in the Cowboy locker room. I'm trying to talk to who? 22-year-olds, 23-year-olds, 27-year-olds. Yeah. You have to be able to relate to them. If I don't do nothing else, I can walk up to a black player. Hey, dog, you rocking with young boy at Dirk. Hey. <laughs> right then, they start laughing. And then I go, now, you know, young boy angry as hell, man. I can't get down with that. <laughs> that boy mad about the world. Now, yeah. maybe it's because he's under house arrest in Utah. I don't know. What you think? Already, right then, we done connected. We good now. But that's what he does. He knows how to connect with them kids. Yeah. And he, it's not fake. He said, give me my theme music. Dog, it's not fake. <laughs> It's authentic. That's why it worked. Yeah, yeah. When he had Key Glock at a, at his at, or Rick Ross um, at a game, it worked because he know them. That's right, right. And he and and he just so happened to be a musician himself. Must be the money was a right. hit. It was a right, hit. Right, right, right. You Must remember be the money? <laughs> you ever asked me about that song, man? No, but I had it in the book, <laughs> and they were like, "You got to take it out because oh. we got to we got to have permission because it's copywritten." I said, "Lyrics are copywritten even in the book." They go, "Yes." Wow, man! I sure would have wish you could have got that in there. But um, no, nah, man. So he's authentic about that, and that's why he connects with the youngsters. And you know, because um, in the book, like they got like a DJ in the locker room before the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they have Gilly and uh, Wallow. Wallow, yeah, Wallow and Gilly before, always before a lot there. of games. Yeah, yeah, I see them. And again, that's just what he do. He not it's it's real. You can't do that if you fake. Nah, you can only do that if you real. He real. Players get down with it, and it doesn't affect whether they win or lose. But it's what it's something that they get they get comfortable with, and so that's why it's good. He the best corner to ever play the game, man. Period. I, and and ain't no and, and that's all I got to say about that. Well, you know what I'm saying? Not many people in that conversation. I mean, you could put Night Train Lane you in that conversation. You can say what you want to say. I'm but it's not a lot of people me. in that conversation. For me. For Revis, you could put them in that conversation. But it's not a lot of people man, in that conversation. He, nah, because he would go back on both sides and all kind of stuff. It's different. Nah, there you go. You, ain't seen, you ain't seen that. First player since 1960 to go both ways. There that you go. See? Here's the thing about Dion, man. This is what I love about Dion. We've talked about this a lot of times. You can't tell him what I can't do. Like, he thinks outside the box. Like, why? You think Travis Hunter would be playing both ways at any other place in America? No. 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 And now what's happened is he didn't set up a dilemma for NFL teams because they're like, Travis Hunter going to be a first round pick. And Travis Hunter going to be like, I want to play both ways. That's right. Now, it's the NFL. So. 
maybe you limit me to 20 plays on offense or 25, not 60. Yeah. But I want a regular role in the offense. That's what I do. Don't limit me. That's all because he went to, to play for Dion. Because Dion knew how to do it because he done it himself. Right. That's what I'm telling you. And because he think outside the box, you can't put limitations on me. That's right. You can't put limitations on boss talk. Why? At all. <laughs> you can't At limit all. what I can do. That's it. I, I, and, and I'm going to prove you. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, with my business, you can't put limitations on me. I'm One of my clients is a hair care company, man. She's oh, really? Like, see, see, see what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. It's called yeah. new standard hair. And she's like, I need you to tell my story and I need you to do this, these things for me to shape my story and, and, you know, so I can put it out there. Right. So we just don't do sports because you can't put me in a box. Wow. I do a lot of things. And that's hard. I, I like it. And I like it because you, when you stretch, it, not only that, you got more gifts and you don't even realize unless you Dude, use them. I do press releases. You know, I do publicity for different companies. I do a lot of different things. Sports is just one aspect of what I do. I write love stories. I write business stories. I write celebrations of life. If it can be written, I do it. <laughs> wow. What what's the what's the what's the end game for twenty twenty four? What what do you want to accomplish this year? Twenty twenty four come in, people made New Year's resolutions, and we're about to wrap this up. But I just want to ask you like what's going down in twenty twenty four? You got to give it up, you know, so so I know what to look forward to. Okay, there's a couple of things. Number one, I'm working on another book. Can't tell you what it is, so don't <laughs> man. <laughs> Uh, the contracts have been signed. That first check has hit the account. Hey, uh, it's a high-profile athlete. Um, it'll be it. It'll people will be, people will scoop it up. It's it, coming out. When is it coming out? Probably coming out. Probably September twenty-five. September I mean, I, I, twenty-five. I do got to work on it though. Yeah, you got to work. I'm on it. I'm working on. I mean, I spend about five hours working on it a day. Hey, that's good stuff, uh, man. But the the other thing is, I'm I'm really doing my business, the JJT Media Group, in terms of writing love stories, writing stories about people's business, because I like telling stories, and I tell stories about people's business, and here's why: when people understand how you created your business and why it's thriving, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a hair care company, whether it's Boss Talk. People connect to it because they understand the struggle and what you went through to create it. And once they connect with it, they ride with you. Wow. And that's the beauty of telling stories. When you tell the story, people understand, oh, that's why it's like this. That's why it's like that. Okay, I get down with that. Oh, I didn't know they overcame that kind of adversity. Mm. Let me support them. When you tell that story and you put that story out there and you tell it eloquently and concisely and you make people feel it. Oh yeah, dog. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful and so that's thing. that's a lot of what we're doing this year. We're expanding, we're growing. The JJT Media Group is uh, doing some big things, and uh, it's fun and exciting for me because I love sports. But I tell people, sports ain't all that I do, dog. Wow, man! Thank you for coming on the show, man. How can people get a hold of you if they're trying to link up with you? If they try, I know that IG. You on that IG? <laughs> you got to be on that IG. I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on IG at uh, uh, the real uh, talk. I mean, the real, real Jacques, Jacques talk, talk is what I meant. Yeah, she uh, I ain't going to tell y'all the truth. This wasn't water up in here. Your girl, Miss Jamaica, got me. She got, in Jamaica. Yeah, you know what you got? You, and it ain't no lucky strike. Either. <laughs> no, so, and, and what about... Uh, you can hit me up there. You can hit me on Twitter at JJT Journalist. How's that Twitter going? How's that world since Elon running things over there? It is what it is, dog. <laughs> I'm not trying to get no pissing match with you now. <laughs> it is what it is. And then uh, you can always hit me for business stuff at uh, Jacques at JJT Media Group. Uh, like I said, we do a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we got some new partnerships. I think about to jump off. We'll make some announcements in the next few weeks. If anything happens, you promise me that you ain't going to hesitate so we can get back on here and talk some more. Anytime, bro. I, I, I definitely don't want you, you to stay You got to sell it, you man. You stayed long, gone too long, didn't he? He was gone for a year and a half. We yeah. gave him the award and we ain't seen him since. <laughs> We had other folks here that we gave awards. We that's the whole plot to get them back. It didn't work. We, we must uh, got you back quick. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Dog. But thank you for coming on the show, man. We love you, Jock Taylor, for sure. My pleasure, my brother. Man, hey man, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. Make sure you guys get in the get a hey, right right where right now. At the end of this video, make sure you look at what's about to pop off. You for to see all type of Little clips and stuff like that for my boy Jacques Taylor, man. Have a man, nice day. it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101 where the bosses talk. Boss Talk 101.